Welcome back to the Computomics podcast. We have another very exciting guest today. Her research focuses on optimizing agricultural processes through integrating molecular biology technologies. And as a professor at the Technical University Munich, she also works on characterizing native biodiversity and identifying its characteristics and developing optimized breeding strategies for complex properties. Chris Schön, welcome to the Computomics podcast. Thank you very much. Chris and I had a quick talk before and, uh, and said it was okay to use first name basis. I'm honored, thank you. <laughs> and um, I was wondering, my research showed that you took a sabbatical in 2020 to focus on research. What exactly did you focus on? Well, we had a very promising results from uh, a research project and uh, we wanted uh, to uh, make the best use uh, of these results and uh, so the sabbatical was mainly about uh, analyzing it in collaboration with uh, one of my students and uh, that was a very important part and then of course uh, in research we're always concerned with what comes next and how uh, are we going to make the best out of the results we have because research also opens new questions and so uh, another very important task was uh, to uh, define future research topics. And what would be those topics that you define? Um, we are uh, mainly concerned with uh, biodiversity and how to use it and uh, so we're trying to find out uh, what is actually useful biodiversity because uh, many people think that uh, maximum biodiversity is uh, what we really need, but we feel that, is, uh, that this is uh, a bit uh, simplified. We really think that uh, we have an optimum biodiversity that we should uh, target. And uh, so that was uh, really the research I was working on and maybe how do we measure uh, opt optimum biodiversity. Did you have already have results or is this something that you're trying to find out in the next research cycle, if you will? Uh, it's something I try to find out uh, in my future research uh, because um, I was quite surprised to find, um, even though we use the term biodiversity in economics, in uh, many aspects, uh, in interdisciplinary research, in uh, breeding, um, there is not really a very good measure for characterizing uh, biodiversity um, in a way that uh, you can say this is a good level and this is maybe uh, too much or uh, not enough. So um, I thought that was quite surprising and that's something I want to focus on. Definitely sounds like something that you should have a better understanding for if that's something that you're trying to strategically achieve, right? Can you give us a, an inkling of, of how you're trying to measure it or, or a working hypothesis maybe? Um, well, I mean, there is uh, uh, some concepts out there uh, where you kind of say, um, like, I can give you an example, maybe from interdisciplinary research, you know, if you have groups uh, that are too diverse, uh, the research might not work because people don't understand each other and they don't know how to talk to each other. Whereas when you're only like a very uh, confined group with a very... Uh, uh, focused topic, of course, there's not much thinking outside the box. So, I mean, there is some strategies to identify the optimum uh, diversity in uh, groups or, uh, and that is uh, what I think uh, might be a concept that uh, I will try to use in reading also, how to identify the optimum diversity. And you said in, the, in introducing these new goals that you're aiming to go for in your research that you already had some promising results or results that actually led you in that direction. Can you tell us a little more about those? Um, yes, uh, what we found was, uh, or maybe I'll start with the research question we had. Um, there is, uh, in, I work on maize and uh, there is uh, land races, for example, of maize, uh, which are populations uh, that uh, were used as uh, varieties in the 50s uh, here, like in Europe. Um, and um, so, but the breeding progress has stopped on those uh, populations because the breeding has focused on uh, like hybrid breeding and has not used those populations 
um, anymore, only as the initial donor of the diversity uh, that was that we're working on now. So uh, one hypothesis is that there is a variation in those land races that we can use for widen the diversity of the germplasm that we're using today. But we don't really have any good evidence for that. It's a hypothesis, but uh, uh, many times, like for example, um, as an example, a resistance trait, um, usually like pathogens and the plants co-evolve. So why would an old land race have a resistance to something that has evolved over 50 years, right? So um, the question really is, is there useful information and useful diversity in those land races? And um, so there hadn't been much evidence for that because it's very difficult to analyze them and to uh, really uh, get a good idea about the diversity contained in the land races. And, so what we did is we focused on very few land races, not a huge broad spectrum, but just uh, very few mm -hmm. and analyzed them in detail. And we used uh, genomics techniques. Uh, we did a lot of uh, sequencing and genotyping and what was most important, we had very good phenotypic data. So we evaluated uh, a trait that we were interested in, which was early development um, in many, many environments. And with these data, uh, we could really show uh, that there is genomic regions um, that contribute new diversity uh, and that is not uh, present in the elite germplasm and that we have favorable uh, effects of some of these uh, areas in the genome that could improve the early development of today's uh, breeding material. And uh, there's very little evidence out there uh, that has shown this before. So we were quite happy to be able to see that. And this research you were just describing, is this part of the MAZE project that is funded by the German Federal Ministry, uh, which you are leading? Yes, exactly. That's uh, what we started out with, because um, it really, you know, like uh, everybody talks about uh, all those precious uh, genetic resources that we have in seed banks and that are available for breeding. And why don't we use it? And uh, why do we work with so little uh, diversity in the germplasm and all this? Uh, but uh, it, there was no evidence that <laughs> the land races should be useful for quantitative traits. Of course, there had been some examples like the green revolution gene, for example, that uh, uh, is of course also came from a genetic resource uh, where you make wheat shorter and so you can intensify the cultivation. So of course that was a very important uh, example where a genetic resource delivered a useful uh, allele or gene, but uh, we work mainly with traits that have a continuous distribution uh, that are quantitative, uh, coded by many, many genes. And for those quantitative traits, it had not really been convincingly shown. And that's why we set out to make, uh, to make uh, a little progress uh, in that respect. Could you, could you uh, specify an example, like which quantitative trait uh, you would be looking at or have been looking at actually? Mm -hmm. Yes, we uh, were mainly interested in early development of maize because maize is, of course, uh, uh, a wonderful crop. That's what I find. Uh, I love it. And I think it's uh, enormous what this plant uh, can really create in terms of biomass. It's a very healthy plant. But uh, one of the criticisms that uh, some people have with maize is that you plant it very late in the year uh, and then in that the soil is not covered for a long time. You need herbicides uh, to take care. Um, so there, there's not too many herb, I don't, the weeds, that there's not so many weeds. And um, so, oh, um, and also you have like a, a leakage of nitrogen if you ha don't have a good soil coverage. So this, and then also if you plant maize earlier, you can extend the vegetation period. What are you trying by, by looking at this quantitative trait of, could we say uh, the point in time where you actually plant it? Would that be a correct way to describe it? Well, the point in time we plant it is how uh, the farmer, that, that's determined by the farmer. Mm -hmm. um, what we're looking at is 
um, especially if uh, the point in time is very early and the temperature is very low, uh, because uh, usually in April, temperatures in uh, Central Europe are not very high. Um, is there um, maize types out there that uh, develop much faster than others that maybe don't need so much uh, uh, temperature, uh, so much heat uh, to, to really develop fast. And that's the idea. Yeah. And you've made progress in identifying these uh, these types or land races of maize uh, in oh, the yes. maize project? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. So what we could actually show is, of course, in our experiments, we always have checks uh, that we use as the gold standard and to which we compare uh, what we have out there. And uh, so what we did is uh, we planted uh, 1,000 different maize types, genotypes we call them. And so we planted 1,000 of them. And um, so what we could actually find is that some of them develop much faster than the Czechs, uh, the commercial varieties that we had out there. So that was already the first success that we had. And then um, what was really nice was that uh, we could identify genomic regions that were responsible for this uh, response. And then uh, the third step was that we could show that some of these uh, of the variation contained in these genomic regions was not present in the elite germplasm. So that was really uh, what we wanted to do and what we set out to do and uh, what was uh, very nice to show. And which methods did you use? Because from what I understand, you have uh, this kind of novel way of including different data sets in your analysis as well. That's correct. Um, and uh, I have to say, of course, it's not only my group that works on this project. It's uh, 10 partners. And uh, so uh, it's always a collaborative effort to do something like this. Well, first of all, it's very difficult to uh, generate these plants that you can test in the field repeatedly. And uh, we are collaborating with a private partner uh, to work on this and they generated the material that would have not been possible at a university because it ne needs huge facilities to do this in a short time because time is also very important in the breeding context. Um, so that was the first thing that was important. And then uh, we also collaborated with partners uh, that are uh, experts in bioinformatics uh, that uh, generated reference sequences from uh, the material that we worked with. There is a maze reference sequence, but it's based on US material. And so the European material, what we call flint material, is so different from the uh, US material that we needed our own reference sequences. So that was another project and that was a basis for the analyses. And, um, and then uh, of course, we also had big field trials uh, that, was, uh, that were distributed um, uh, across many uh, locations. And then we collaborated with uh, the group in Hohenheim, for example, or we collaborated um, with a group in Spain uh, to also have our field trials uh, there and uh, to get very good phenotypic data. You, you mentioned that there were, that you looked at the flint lines. This was in the first phase of the project. Mm -hmm. Are you focusing on the other lines? I think they're called dent lines uh, in the second part. And can you specify what the difference is? Because I, I, maybe I should have said that in the introduction. I am not from the field, so I'm, I always ask from the perspective of someone uh, who doesn't really know a lot about it, but is excited to learn more. So how would you explain the difference between the two and uh, the focus in the second phase? The difference between uh, like the flint lines and the dent lines originate really from hybrid breeding. In huh. hybrid breeding, um, what you do, uh, actually, you do something that's quite funny. Um, you have, uh, let's say, outcrossing populations, and you have several of them. And then uh, what you do is you inbreed those populations by selfing them, and you create a lot of inbreeding depression. And then what this does, though, is that you get uh, immortal and reproducible genetic units, because inbred lines can be multiplied many times. And it helps to select the best plant out of the population also. So that's the two uh, 
ideas behind making things bad. And then in the end, you cross again two inbred lines to make the hybrid. And so the reason why we have like a flint and a dent population is that the more diverse these populations are, the more they complement each other and the higher the heterosis usually is, which gives us uh, additional uh, advantage uh, in hybrid breeding. And traditionally in Europe, um, hybrid breeding started uh, in the 50s and uh, the material uh, came from the US and the, it was a material that uh, was uh, adapted to the climatic conditions there and it had high yield. It was very high yielding, uh, but it was not adapted to European conditions and uh, the populations that we work with, the land races, they were adapted, those flint land races. And, um, and then uh, people made uh, inbred lines in each of the populations. And so the flint then brought uh, like, uh, like the more cold tolerance and uh, early flowering and everything that then from the US didn't have. And uh, the two populations, they're called dent and flint because uh, the flint is, has just very hard kernels and it's kind of a flinty type of kernel and the dent it looks like a, a tooth a little bit like a tooth and that's why it's called dent -tripasm. Ah, that's good to good to remember it so what exactly are you trying to do in phase two now with i guess more of a focus on the dent lines how do you put the research results from the first phase together with the the second phase i know i should focus on the dent lines but i'd like to mention one thing of course um, we're still working i mean the material we developed during the first phase in the flint it's very very useful for now cloning a lot of genes it's like we can crank out uh, a lot of uh, variation and uh, really identify um, now the genes that are underlying uh, a lot of traits. And so that's what we're concerned with uh, also in the second phase and we work on that. Uh, and I think we're quite happy with, uh, we have, we have uh, variation for more than 50 traits. And I think that gives us uh, a lot of uh, potential for uh, uh, like identifying genes uh, that underlie uh, genetic variation in maize flint material. And in the dent material, we felt that it's not enough just to focus on one of the European pools, but uh, we're now looking at dent material um, that we generated uh, because um, we thought also that uh, drought tolerance is a very important topic in the future. Like uh, a lot of areas in Europe already suffer from drought and uh, we thought we would like to also address uh, drought tolerance as a a very important trait for the future. And uh, so we decided that we will take eight lines from the dent pool. And uh, these eight lines had been pre-tested in another project um, where uh, like a, a very large set of 250 lines was tested in 30 environments all across Europe and um, under a lot of drought and heat, uh, uh, in a lot of environments that vary for drought and heat. And so we selected eight of these lights uh, from, from which we think that they will give us variation for drought tolerance and uh, that are also adapted more to the central European environments. And that is what we will now look at. We derived inbred lines from this material and we'll test that now in Hungary, in Italy, and also here in uh, Germany and uh, investigate the drought tolerance and then also try to, of course, to find the genes underlying the drought tolerance. And, and now you raised my curiosity uh, when you mentioned you identified 50 traits from the, the flint lines. Uh, can, you, can you go into a little more detail there? Maybe, maybe ones that you personally find the most interesting or the, the, that, that get you excited the most? Well, uh, I think what's quite exciting is that uh, there is uh, like photosynthesis related traits that uh, we could look at uh, because the material um, varies a lot. I think I have to say that one of the drawbacks is that uh, uh, we always find genes uh, that are bad, you know, the alleles that are bad, uh, but that mm. doesn't matter, you know, because um, once we find uh, the gene, we can go into the material, into the elite material and 
then screen for allelic variation there. So uh, the land traces kind of give us uh, an idea on which genes are involved, and then we will look into the uh, elite material and see how these genes are, uh, how they look, how the alleles look in elite material there. So that will be very useful. And then, so it's photosynthesis related traits, it's disease resistant traits, it's developmental traits, uh, like of course, also the plant morphology is very different. And then of course, uh, we also have, of course, yield data, we have uh, maturity data, we have uh, flowering time data, all the agronomic traits, plant height. Um, so we have a lot of traits assessed uh, in, in our trials. That's, uh, and all of them are very exciting, I think. <laughs> you don't have a favorite? I think I, I will probably, um, what we're doing at the moment is uh, we're, uh, two of my students work, one works on lodging, that is uh, the, the plants fall over uh, because of some root traits. So I think he picked the hardest traits you can go for actually. So but <laughs> he needs a challenge, I suppose. And um, uh, I think, and, and another one uh, works on uh, early development now on a, on a gene uh, about early development and uh, um, I think uh, probably if we think about going into the next phase, we might actually go for photosynthesis related traits. Yeah. Why those? If, if you, you, I made you pick a favorite, I know you didn't choose to, yes. Yes. <laughs> but why those? Oh, I mean, yes. photosynthesis in C4 is still not understood very well in C4 plants. So maize is a C4 plant. It has a different uh, photosynthesis uh, pathway than uh, like a uh, wheat or, uh, and it's uh, quite efficient because of that. But um, the like water use efficiency and photosynthesis, of course, are related. And uh, so I think that's uh, why I'm interested in it because uh, the accumulation of biomass, of course, is uh, something that also has a high relevance for uh, practical uh, cultivation of plants. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think I like it because it's a combination of basic research and with a high impact. I think that's why I like it. Yeah, it makes, makes total sense. And I mean, we've, we've been talking a lot about the research, both the results you've had and also the goals, um, but there's also a technical aspect to the MAZE project, uh, if, if I understand that correctly. What would you say are the, maybe the technical goals or things you've already achieved? Let's focus on the, on the results first. Have you any methods or technical advancements that came from the project? Um, I mean, actually we have a, quite a few. Uh, it's, um... Well, first of all, what I already mentioned is that we analyzed uh, four uh, reference genomes or uh, kind of uh, assembled four reference genomes for the European maze uh, uh, that is very important for uh, all the cloning activities that we have. Uh, and that's not trivial, you know, I mean, to assemble these uh, uh, genomes is uh, it's quite complicated. And um, then uh, what we also, of course, have uh, achieved is that uh, um, we have uh, developed uh, software and uh, methods, statistical methods for uh, how to analyze the data, how to compare haplotypes in the land races to haplotypes in elite germplasm. So haplotypes are short uh, DNA sequences uh, that we compare uh, and then we say, okay, exactly that sequence is present in the elite germplasm or not. But the definition of a haplotype, how long it has to be, how many bases does it have to contain, um, is very, very uh, difficult. And it's still an open question how to do that. And I think uh, we've done very well on that. And then a colleague in Göttingen, uh, also from the uh, MACE project, developed some software uh, called Haploblocker to define haplotypes in a slightly different way than what it, how it's done in human genetics. So um, I think we have also made quite some progress there. Uh, other colleagues have worked on um, uh, like uh, implementing uh, deep learning approaches or uh, neural networks for uh, predicting uh, the performance of uh, like maze lines. And uh, I think also some progress has been made there. Um, and I think actually for us also the generation of the material in itself was a big success that it actually worked to get inbred lines out of land races because you have to see those land races they carry what we say a high genetic load 
um, when you inbreed them, they will very often die. So because they have such a high load of genes that are unfavorable and or even lethal and um, because they have not gone through a breeding process. So that's also been quite, uh, quite good for us. Just the length of your answer shows how much you've already achieved with the project. In an ideal world, what would you say or what would you dream the outcome of the project to be? Um, I think I would like it if people use the resource because we made it publicly available. And I think there's a lot more work than we can shoulder. Uh, in Even if we're 10 partners, uh, there is so much variation in there. And I would be very happy if colleagues would uh, kind of pick up Uh, some of the lines or like uh, some research questions and uh, uh, we are very happy to share the material with them. Where would someone be able to access that? I mean, we have all these listeners out there. Someone might might now be curious now that you've mentioned it. Where can they find that information? Um, you know, um, a lot of the data has become public already through publication. So you can either download it from uh, like through the publications or um, a lot of the material um, is accessible through uh, material transfer agreements because they're uh, genetic resources and we're obliged to make them freely available to other people and we're happy to do so, very happy to do so. And uh, of course, then also uh, depending on the uh, research topic, we can also make uh, the genotypic data or sequencing data also available to partners. Is there an aspect, we're heading towards the end, but I always like to ask, um, is there an aspect that we haven't talked about that you personally find uh, noteworthy about the project? I think what I find noteworthy is that people realize that this is a long process. Uh, to um, Those populations haven't seen breeding uh, for a long time, right? They're like 50 years back. And uh, so uh, what we need to do is uh, close the gap in performance between those populations and what we have now. That's one thing. And that cannot be done in a very short project, right? So that's a, a, a very a big task. The second thing is maybe to start out with, uh, or to, to end with what I started out with, that uh, diversity by itself is not uh, a favorable, beneficial thing. Uh, you really need to know what kind of diversity you want, how much diversity you want, and how to make best use of it. I think that's really um, something uh, that is important. Um, I think what's also important to me is that um, um, the project is a very good example of a public-private partnership, I think, because we're able uh, to publish all the results that we um, uh, obtain, that uh, uh, we can uh, share all the material that has been um, provided and that the, also that the private partner, KWS, has made a huge effort in providing us with phenotypic data. So I think phenotypic data is really a, a very, very important aspect and uh, this would not have been possible without a public-private partnership. I think that's also something that's important to me. Yeah. And, uh, and of course, it's a collaborative effort. Things like that cannot be done by uh, individual groups. Um, and we're very grateful, of course, uh, to the BMBF and uh, uh, that they funded this project. And uh, uh, we've been very happy uh, with the project, yes. You've achieved a lot. How long will the project run? You're in phase two. Phase one is already complete. Phase two will run. Oh. If you have a broad, a broad idea. Oh, I think we're um, not even midway of the second uh, three years, uh, I suppose. Uh, I'm not very good with these. Uh, That would mean 2023. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I'm, I'm not quite sure when it ends, to be honest, because we're, that's not the two categories we think in. We're just doing our work and then... Uh, But we're already getting prepared for uh, preparing the next uh, proposal and the next phase. And we already have ideas on how to do that. So it's a continuous process. So <laughs> sorry, I'm not quite sure. But I, I think we started like one and a half years ago. So we should be probably midway in like another one and a half years. Probably. Mm -hmm. Yeah.
Uh -huh. Yeah, so that would be early 2023. Yes. Um, I think, but I mean, this goes with everything that you've been saying as well. This is not a process that that has a, a clear beginning. You know, it starts on that date and then it it ends at exactly that date. But right. rather, it's a continuous process, and and hopefully, we'll have even more great results to work with, and then to 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 go deeper, right, in different in different aspects. That's the idea, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think uh, we've learned a lot about the MACE project. Computomics is very excited to be a part of it in phase two as well. Um, thank you so much, Chris, for this uh, lovely interview, for, for teaching us so much about um, the results, but also the, the goals and the further outlook of the MACE project and that particular research. To you listeners, I hope uh, you found this as exciting as I did. Uh, you can find some notes on our website, and I look forward to having you all back for the next episode of the Computomics Podcast. Mm -hmm.